Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. The debate in Washington about what to do about the recession has more or less resolved or focused on one critical point. Does more public debt lead to less growth? The Republicans certainly give a resounding yes to that. They would like to see bigger cuts to government spending in, in, in order to spur growth, they say. But critics of President Obama's approach, which he calls balanced, are saying he's more or less buying into the same argument, which is more public debt means less growth, these critics say. It may be the other way around. In fact, a recent study done at the Perry Institute shows, in fact, looking at the Reinhardt Rogoff study, which for those of you that haven't followed this study, is a study done by two eminent Harvard economists who said that when public debt reaches 90%, you have a serious restriction, if not a collapse of growth. The Perry Institute study seemed to debunk at least the 90% figure, if not more. So now we're gonna have a discussion, perhaps a debate, about that basic concept. Does public debt at higher levels restrict growth or not? Now joining us to discuss all of this, first of all, is one of the authors of the Perry Institute study, Bob Poland. He's also the founder of the Perry Institute and co-director. The Perry Institute is in Amherst, Massachusetts. He's a widely published author. His latest book is Back to Full Employment. Thanks for joining us, Bob. Thank you very much for having me, Paul. Also joining us from Washington is Joseph Minerick. He's the Senior Vice President and Director of Research at the Committee for Economic Development in Washington, D.C. He was the Chief Economist of the Office of Management and Budget for eight years under the Clinton administration. He helped to formulate the administration's program to eliminate budget deficit and including the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1993 and the Bipartisan Balanced Budget Act of 1997. Thanks very much for joining us, Joseph. Happy to be here. So, Joseph, I'm going to start with you. Let, let's talk about President Obama's basic economic approach. And the, the underlying concept there he gives is that this is a balanced approach, that, that public debt is a problem, it does need to be address, addressed. He wants a sort of grand bargain with the Republicans to do all of this. Do you think this is a correct approach? Well, every situation is unique. Uh, we are now in an absolutely unique situation. Uh, no way you can challenge that, certainly in the living memory of virtually every American, uh, possibly in the history of the Republic. Uh, we had an economic crisis, a financial crisis of a magnitude and character that we simply had never seen before. Um, the president's approach starting in the beginning of his administration was to try to reestablish economic growth. To do that, he was willing to uh, increase budget deficits by both increasing spending and reducing tax revenues. I think many economists agreed with that general premise. If anything, looking back with the wisdom of hindsight, the situation that the president inherited was even worse uh, than we anticipated at the time, and the route of getting out of it has proven to be even more difficult. Um, in the longer term, when we eventually get to the point where we have re-established re uh, firm economic growth, uh, the president apparently believes, and I personally would agree with him, that we will need to take steps to reduce the burden of the nation's public debt uh, so that we can continue to have substantial growth in the long term. Uh, the president is in a constrained environment. Uh, what he can do in the very near term in terms of legislation is restricted by the Congress with which he has to work. Um, I don't know that you're seeing the president's first choices in very many of the decisions that he's making, and I don't know what the outcomes will be. Joseph, uh, I, I guess the, the, the underlying question I'm asking you is, do you think increased public debt restricts growth? Because that seems to be the premise both the Republicans and President Obama accept. In the longer term, and I'm abstracting from the current period of sluggish economic growth, uh, in the longer term, I do believe that greater debt restricts your ability to grow an economy. Uh, the most fundamental reason is if I'm running the federal government, I would prefer not to have to pay so many of my tax dollars 
in debt service. Right now, interest rates are very low. Once the economy recovers, interest rates will rise substantially. The cost of the federal government's debt service is going to rise. Uh, the dollars that I pay to service the debt do nothing for the economy. There are other things I would like to be able to do. I'd like to invest in infrastructure. I'd like to invest in human capital. Every dollar that I spend on debt service is a dollar that I cannot spend on things that I believe will make the economy grow more rapidly. And just so, quickly, just quickly, the, the, word, the study of the Perry Institute, which uh, many people think have more or less refuted uh, uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff's study of the 90 percent equals uh, collapse of growth formula. Uh, you've looked at the, I know you've had an initial look at the Perry work. Has it changed your thinking on this at all? One thing that the paper definitely does uh, is it refutes the notion of a cliff at 90% of GDP. Um, personally, I never thought that that cliff was the essence of what I considered to be the important argument. Uh, when I look at, at Bob's findings with his colleagues, uh, it looks to me like what you have in their results is a relationship where greater debt tends to reduce growth, but not without that cliff effect at 90% of GDP. So if, if I'm king of the world, I would prefer to have lesser debt so that I would have more options to try to make the economy grow more rapidly. Um, what Bob has told me is that I don't have to worry about uh, stepping off the edge of the mountain at 90%. I think that's true, uh, but I think in the longer term, less debt is better, all else equal. Okay, Bob, uh, your take on the basic, seems the basic debate here is does more public debt equal less growth? And, and just respond to Joseph's comments. Well, I think uh, Joseph's uh, saying things that I basically agree with. That is, in, as a matter of principle, over the long term, I, I uh, totally agree that uh, having public debt uh, is, not, is not going to be a favorable thing relative to not having public debt over the long term, abstracting from uh, major recessions. I mean, over the long term, Everyone should pay their taxes, their fair share of taxes on April 15th. As we've talked about before, I think including Wall Street should pay a transaction tax that could raise, uh, according to my calculations, in the range of $300 billion a year for a modest tax. That would help a lot in financing necessary, important programs. So that's, I totally agree with that. I think we should cut the military budget and I think we should uh, be able to spend a lot less on health care over the long term than we spend now, which is roughly twice what other advanced economies spend. So over the long term, I have no problem with that. The issue for today is, as Joseph himself said well, uh, how do we get out of this massive uh, historic crisis that was created by Wall Street hyperspeculation, by deregulation, and if I may say so, by deregulation that the Clinton administration uh, supported very strongly at the time. Uh, that led to the financial crisis and the Great Recession. At the time, and again, I agree with uh, Joseph, uh, President Obama in 2009 pursued a pretty aggressive uh, program of uh, counter-cyclical government spending, def borrowing money, spending on the economy, cutting taxes. We can debate on the details and the magnitude. I have issues with it, but in principle, overall, it was the right thing to do. And that is why our government deficit went up so sharply starting in 2009, and now why we have high public debt. Uh, now, the other thing, as Joseph also said, uh, the US government has been borrowing at very low rates. So that even though we ha have been borrowing a lot, and even though over the long term we should not continue borrowing so much, it happens that our interest burden on the debt now and then for the next few years is very low, is historically low. It's less than half of what it was on, on average under Presidents Reagan and Bush. So we have a lot of room to pursue 
uh, further uh, stimulus to get the economy back on a healthy growth path. So Joseph, uh, uh, th there seems to be agreement in, in this long-term view it's better to have less public debt than more public debt. But the question is now, what, the, the, what is the sense of urgency? And if you look at President Obama's recent policy decisions uh, from sequestration, social security cuts, his whole grand bargain is not, is not so far out some of these effects. And, and, and you don't see him out stumping, for example, for increased funding to states and municipalities and such things that he did do in the first year or two. So, I mean, uh, it seems to me what Bob is saying is that, you know, everybody can agree on the long-term issue, but it's, it's about what, it, what to do now is where the debate seems to be. And the president is in an awkward position. I mean, he could stump for a lot of things uh, with a 0% probability of getting them. Uh, so he's probably making a calculation of where the playing field is and what, you know, what his live options are. Um, if I had my druthers, I would begin to talk about making the adjustments we'd have to make to uh, bring federal budget deficits down over the longer term. But I'd want to do it in a prospective and a very carefully phased way um, where, you know, the, the president doesn't apparently at this point have that option. Uh, I hope that when we get down to the point where we're actually having some serious conversations here in Washington, which haven't happened yet, uh, that we'll start thinking in those terms because it's going to be important. This is going to be a, a very, this is going to be the biggest challenge in macroeconomic policy making in perhaps the history of the Republic. It's going to be a very, very difficult problem getting out of the situation we're in right now. Let me add just one more point relative to something that uh, Bob said. It is true that debt service costs right now are very low. And for a short period of time, that did, does give us some flexibility. You want to keep in mind that approximately one third of the public debt uh, matures within one year. Another one third matures within between one and five years. So once interest rates go up, there will be a fairly rapid process of debt service cost increasing, and it will increase substantially. Uh, you know, we now have, um, I haven't looked today, we now have interest rates on uh, three month treasury bills at an annual yield of about 0.2%. Uh, if we go back to the historical average of the good times in the 1990s, we're looking about something like 4%. The cost of servicing every individual T-bill is going to increase by a factor of 20. And that change is going to happen very quickly. All of those securities, by definition, mature within three months. Uh, so we're going to have a quick turnover of the debt. Debt service cost is going to rise very rapidly. That's part of the reason why we've gotten ourselves into such a terrible box right now. So, Bob, there's kind of two points there, though. The politics, the real politic of what's possible. But let's go to the point two first, and then we'll come back to the politics, which is that the cost of servicing this debt is going to rise, and, and this cheap money isn't going to last forever. So, you, you, you do, so there is a sense of urgency about addressing the public debt. What, what do you make of that? Uh, well, of course, uh, interest rates will go up. Uh, but I'm not sure exactly when. Uh, deficit Hawks said the interest rates were going to skyrocket in 2009. Instead, the uh, short-term interest rates, especially the Treasury rates and the federal funds rate, which is the central bank, the Fed's policy target rate, are at historic lows. The result of which is, again, we're paying less than half uh, as a percentage of total expenditures in interest than we paid under Reagan and Bush. We're paying about 6.3%. Six uh, 6 Even the long-term average is, is around 9%. So we're three percentage points below what the average has been. Now, we will go, yes, we will get back up towards that average, but uh, keep in mind that uh, Bernanke has said that he's going to keep the uh, federal funds rate at zero until the employment rate uh, rises to six and a half percent. So we still have some room here. 
And so I don't disagree in principle with the idea that we need to be concerned, but we also need to be concerned with the fact that we still have mass unemployment. And if we impose austerity now, as we are doing, more mildly than in Europe, but we're still pursuing it, if we keep laying off teachers, if we keep laying off healthcare workers, if we keep cutting budgets to state and local governments, uh, we are going to uh, go back into a long-term employment stagnation mode. We're not going to get out of the crisis. So that, to me, seems to be the number one priority now. Joseph? Well, interest rates are going to rise when the economy improves. The reason why interest rates are low is because there's very limited demand for credit. And there's very limited demand for credit because of the weakness in consumer demand and the corresponding, therefore, uh, limited demand for investment on the part of businesses. Uh, you know, Bob is absolutely right. We do not know the hour when interest rates are going to begin to rise. We ought to be very cautious about putting our foot on the economic break in terms of macroeconomic policy. Uh, but uh, the time is going to come when interest rates do rise. And when they do, it's going to be a very difficult maneuver uh, between monetary policy and fiscal policy uh, to begin to make that switch toward uh, a lower budget deficit while at the same time not choking off the economic recovery. So no quarrel again on principle, but uh, you know we have put ourselves in a very awkward position right now. Well, but, uh, but, but, there, but there is a quarrel on principle here, it seems to me. I mean, Bob is saying that the, the focus needs to be on mass unemployment. And you start with that, and, and you, you seem to be saying that you need to deal more with the problem that interest rates will rise, so focus on the public debt. I mean, those are two very different approaches, aren't they? No, I don't think so. I think we're, we're both talking about questions of timing. Uh, the question is, when do you begin to deal with the budgetary issue? You do not want to have uh, a major fiscal contraction at this time. This is not the right moment for it. The economy is still weak. There are still risks with respect to the situation in Europe with respect to uh, our own housing market. Uh, so we do have to postpone that. Uh, at some point, we're going to have to make that transition. It is going to be one of the most difficult transitions in economic policy uh, in the history of this country. I think if you gave the controls, if Bob and I were in a, a driver's education car, you know, and we're sitting with two steering wheels and two sets of pedals, uh, we might make those adjustments at slightly different times. But uh, I think we're both saying that now is not the moment for restrictive fiscal policy. That moment will come at some point in the future. It's a matter of judgment when that moment arrives. But, but, at, but, at, the, but at the level of President Obama and, and the Republicans and the deal-making going on, we are seeing various forms of austerity. Uh, Can I, I, I can't speak for the president. Uh, however, I would imagine that if the president were philosopher king, uh, his sense of the timing of these issues, the appropriate way to adjust policy, would be very much in harmony with what Bob is saying and what I'm saying, even though it might not be precisely what either one of us would choose to do. Bob, the, the thing still seems to be what to do now. There, there does seem to me there's more, more difference here than perhaps we're, we're hearing. Well, one thing I would say is, uh, one, let's get, of course, I'm, I'm not a political expert, uh, but I want to speak to the politics of the moment a little bit. I think that Obama has made a terrible mistake, and I don't know what's in his heart of hearts. But I think he's made a terrible mistake in making concessions, uh, preemptive concessions on Social Security and Medicare. I mean, when they ran, when he ran for president, uh, he and especially Joe Biden made very clear that we are not going to cut Social Security, period. No Democratic president, to my knowledge, very few Democratic policymakers of any kind have ever favored cutting Social Security. And the cut that Obama has proposed, which it sounds like a technical adjustment by changing the cost of living index, it really is a cut. 
and it really actually is significant for uh, tens of millions of old pe older elderly people. Uh, and uh, that was the wrong way to go. I mean, if we are going to say, uh, look, it is absolutely necessary for us to start cutting uh, government spending now, which I don't believe is the case, but let's say it is, then Obama should say, therefore, we are going to have to cut the military a little more because we've ended two wars. Therefore, we're going to have to impose a tax on Wall Street, like they already have in Great Britain, and like 11 other countries in uh, the European Union are now starting to implement. That's the way to close the budget deficit, whether we do it next week or in 12 months. But to do it on the backs of elderly people, vulnerable elderly people, is simply wrong in principle, and in practical terms, it is not even necessary. Joseph? We're going to have to make a decision uh, about whether we want a social security system that, you know, now that we're getting to that issue, uh, whether we want a social security system that is self-financing uh, and that is sustainable over the long haul. The current system, unfortunately, is not. Um, the president proposed making several changes in Social Security. One of them has gotten all of the attention. Uh, you can do, the president has proposed to make adjustments uh, that would protect, protect low-income seniors and particularly long-lived retirees for whom that CPI adjustment over the long haul uh, would be most significant. Uh, but let's, you know, we can, we can talk about that. The packaging clearly needs some need some work but the most important point here with respect to social security is do we want a retirement system that is that finances itself and that can continue operating in the long term on a pay-as-you-go basis uh, if we decide that we want to do that we're going to have to make some adjustments uh, if we decide that we're willing to go to general revenue financing uh, that gives us some other options, but it's not necessarily what the people of the United States want. That's but, a, that's a uh, want without, big with, I think the Social Security thing is so much its own discussion. Why don't we kind of put that aside for a second, uh, because, uh, other than the fact that it's kind of reflection of an, uh, an outlook. But Bob raised two other issues. If, 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 if dealing with debt is so urgent, then what about why not major much more major cuts on the military side and what what about much more revenue on the other side i know there's real politic about this about what's winnable but it's isn't it also a question if, if president obama wants to do these things about educating the american public about what needs to be done i mean what's your view on these issue of, of major cuts to the military and, and and increased revenue like the financial transaction tax well if you look at the president's numbers over 10 years uh, the annual appropriations that he proposed for both the defense part of the budget and the non-defense part of the budget will be reaching, expressed as a percentage of GDP, they will reach the lowest numbers on record by 2017. And from there, they will be cut even further. Uh, as a percentage of GDP, by the time you get to the last year of the president's budget proposal, 2023, you have a reduction from that record low defense level of 2017 by another 20 percent expressed as a percentage of GDP. So in one year, you might say that the president's defense reductions are not that large. Uh, looking over the entire 10-year proposal, he's going to unexplored territory both on defense appropriations and on non-defense appropriations. Now, Defense is, requires a really thorough analysis. We have to decide what we want our defense establishment to do uh, and how we're going to fund it, how much we're going to rely on our allies, uh, what uh, current missions we're willing to throw over the side and decide that we're, we don't want to do. I don't believe that we have had that analysis yet, and in that respect, I think Bob and I would agree we need a very thorough debate on that issue. And it, we're probably going to have to make some decisions that a lot of Americans, if they gave their gut reactions, 
uh, they'd initially say, I don't want to take that risk. So there is a need for public education on that front. There's as much of a need for public education with respect to the non-defense activities of government. Uh, we've got a long, long way to go on both of those issues. And um, right. frankly, if you look at the president's budget cut numbers over a 10-year period, they're pretty large. Bob, what's your take on that? Well, the uh, defense budget as a share of GDP, as Joseph uh, of course knows as a major official in the Clinton administration and Clinton's last year of office was approximately 3% of GDP and during uh, Bush and then Obama it rose up to 4.7% of GDP so that's a 1.7% uh, in percentage point increase so that's uh, 260 billion dollars in today's economy that's a lot so according to the Defense Department, the, if we did the sequestration, which we probably are not going to end up doing it at all, uh, and there's no other wars, uh, by 2017, we're back at around 3% of GDP defense budget. Um, so uh, that's, you know, the, the issue of getting the defense budget down by 2017, would, that's with, without having any wars, uh, we're going to be back where we were at the end of the Clinton administration. Okay, so that is uh, under reasonable control. We could probably get it lower. Uh, but the other point, as I mentioned, raising tax revenues. It's time to put a tax on Wall Street transactions, like is being done in Europe, is already done in the UK on stocks. And that can raise about $300 billion per year, as long as we catch all transactions. So that can be a major new source of revenue. It will also uh, discourage somewhat the hyperspeculation that brought the economy down in the first place. And that's where we need to look. The other place we need to look is the stranglehold that insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies have on our healthcare system. Uh, we pay twice as much uh, per capita uh, in the United States as other countries do on health care, and they get better outcomes. So I'm not saying we have to have an exact Canadian-style system, but some the principle of, of expanding Medicare for all will enable us to have the kinds of uh, benefits for people as we have an aging population and not have to break the back of the economy to enable elderly people to live decent lives. I mean, the, and I know we're not on Social Security, but we're at about the budget, which is ironic. Why are we, indeed, why are we focused on Social Security when that isn't the issue for today? The issue for today is the fact that we've got this major problem of uh, getting out of the recession. The recession was caused by uh, Wall Street hyperspeculation. It's time to regulate Wall Street. It's time to tax Wall Street. And it's time to uh, refocus on job creation for now. Okay, just finally, uh, let me get this down to one specific question, which maybe deals with the, the, the dispute about when uh, one focuses on public debt and when one focuses on, on unemployment. Joseph, what is your take? Some people are suggesting the only way, one, to get the, the economy going, the only way really to address unemployment is some kind of massive direct jobs program, whether it's done through uh, the cities, the states, uh, it's going to take a federal government funding to do it, uh, but there, without a direct massive jobs program, the situation doesn't change. What do you make of that idea? Well, I think Bob and I would probably go about that initiative in a different way. I think we, you know, we agree that the steps that were taken in 2009 were in the right direction, not necessarily the way either of us would have chosen. Uh, you know, one of the problems with the situation we have right now, one of the reasons why I said that this, this dance is going to be so hard to choreograph, is the fact that we make budgets on a one-year basis. Uh, you know, normally when we're talking about quick reactions in macroeconomic policy, we're talking about monetary policy. Monetary policy, the, the monetary accelerator is flat on the floor. We don't have any more adjustment there. Uh, I would do something on the fiscal side of the budget. I don't know that I would call it a jobs program. I would probably, uh, 
try to inject spending power into the economy in a more generic way. I would look at assistance to state and local governments because they're strapped right now and they are laying off uh, teachers and other workers, as Bob said earlier. Uh, I would probably also put some money into the hands of consumers uh, in the form of temporary tax cuts. But yes, if you gave me my first choice, I would engage in a fiscal stimulus right now. Um, I can tell you, you don't have to be a uh, political wizard here in Washington to know that uh, stimulus has become a dirty word and uh, the possibility of moving in that direction, unfortunately, is extremely limited, if not nil. And Bob, same question to you in terms of a massive jobs program. And, and, does, and, and what, if not a massive jobs program, is there an end to this recession? Well, uh, massive jobs program, absolutely. How we enact one uh, is tricky. Uh, I think uh, the easiest way to think about it is as Joseph just said, and as I mentioned before, the state and local governments in combination are the biggest single source of employment in the economy, directly and indirectly through the jobs they create through their suppliers. Uh, so why would we let the state and local governments budgets uh, contract? We need to actually expand them. So if you want to think about a massive jobs program, we don't have to build new bureaucracies. We just have to prevent the state and local governments from uh, you know, contracting education, contracting health care, contracting family services, uh, contracting health and safety. Uh, that's, that would be a massive jobs program. I know, you know right here at my own university is a public university. And we benefited greatly from the last stimulus program. We would benefit from another one. And so those things, and you can expand the UMass story out to every other community that has a major university. So that would be a massive jobs program. I would also just add though, as Joseph said, you know, the monetary policy can't get any more aggressive because this interest rate that the Fed has set for policy is zero. But as we've talked about before, Paul, the problem is that though we have the zero interest rate policy, what is happening is that commercial banks are piling up cash hoards. The commercial banks are holding $1.5 trillion in cash hoards at the Fed. They may also be holding a lot more. They are holding a lot more short-term uh, bonds, government bonds, U.S., Brazilian bonds. But I'm just talking about the amount that they're holding in cash at the Fed. I have proposed, and we've talked about, and other people have proposed, that we start forcing the, the banks to lend some of that. And the way to do that is to either set a maximum level of reserves that the banks can hold, otherwise they're taxed, or a direct tax. And that would change the incentives of the banks and getting them reconnected into actually putting money into the economy, especially into the hands of small businesses. So, Joseph, just to finish off, uh, you're saying you'd like to see a, a stimulus now, but we don't hear President Obama saying that. Uh, the president hears categorical statements from the other side that there is no interest in a jobs program, no interest in a stimulus program, no interest in anything, in anything of that kind. Uh, in that environment, uh, you know, you can... Uh, uh, you can talk to the wind, but the wind probably is not going to listen. So I think the president is making a calculation of what's feasible and uh, trying to make the best judgment in an environment that he considers to be less than perfect. Bob, uh, this final word then. Uh, president Obama can't do other than he's doing. Well, you know, again, I'm not in Washington. I'm not a Washington insider by any means. Uh, I do think that the president can make some principled stands that would energize the population. Uh, I think, as we said, if he could, if he just would say, as he said on the campaign, "I am never going to cut Social Security," uh, if he said, "We can't, we've just got to stop cutting budgets for educating our kids. We just have to do that." I think he could mobilize and and in the process create jobs. I think he could mobilize people. Whether he would get the Republicans to move. I agree with Joseph. Uh, again, I just read the news. Uh, I'm not in D.C., 
but I agree that it probably wouldn't happen. The one thing that I think could actually feasibly happen is, as I said, to push the money that is sitting in the coffers of the commercial banks into the economy. We're not talking about uh, pocket change here. We're talking about a trillion and a half dollars. We're talking about that's 10% of GDP. Even if you got half of that into the hands of small businesses, that would also be a massive jobs program. All right. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you Thanks very much for having, for having me, Paul. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.